Good afternoon. We're excited to have you join us today. I'm Julie Woodward. I'm the Senior Manager of Forestry Education with the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. And it's my pleasure to be your host today and uh, bring you this Tree School Online webinar. Today, the Tree School Online production is a production of OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to OFRI for helping lead this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. Thanks to Carrie Berger for, from OSU who's helping co-host today. Tree School Online's webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th and there are two webinars each Tuesday, one at 10 a.m. and another at 3 p.m. A few housekeeping details today before we get uh, into the presentation. So many of you have probably been on Zoom before, but there is a Zoom toolbar. It's often located at the bottom of your screen. If you use your cursor, you can scroll over the bottom and it'll uh, pop up and there's some features there you can use throughout the presentation. If you're on a hardware such as iPad, uh, if you Zoom, the Zoom toolbar bar might be on the top of your display. Just to let participants know, the audio is muted as well as your video is also muted are uh, not available today, just those that are presenting. The participant list is there. Uh, you can pop that up and you can see who's on there today, the attendees and panelists. And you're also welcome uh, to post in chat. We're using chat today to for technical problems. So if you have any questions uh, about the the uh, how things are being run. The written questions, we ask that you post those in the Q&A box. So we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar and we'll answer any and all of your questions that we can at the end of the presentation. The chat, as mentioned, will be used throughout to um, post some websites, links, and you can also, if you have any questions of the panelists. So there's some resources that'll be available to after today um, and they'll be on the Tree School Online class guide. And you can get to that page, similar to where you went to register on the knowyourforest.org and click on the Tree School Online page. It uh, has the click on the webinar description and then look for the webinar and you'll see above each webinar is a webinar uh, instructor resource. And that's where you can find some resources after the webinar today. Each webinar is being recorded, and the great thing is they'll be archived and available on YouTube video and also accessible through that Tree School Online page. So you can go back and watch this again. Uh, we will be using some polls throughout the day. We like to do those at the beginning, about the middle and the end. And um, it should just pop right up on your screen and some you can click and answer those questions. If uh, it doesn't, there is a button that should pop up, kind of a highlighted on that toolbar that you can click on to participate. And with that, I'll um, like to introduce our two presenters today. And we're excited to have Lauren Grand. She's with OSU Extension as the Lane County Extension Forester, and she uh, joined them in 2016. And Lauren's role is to provide objective, research-based educational opportunities related to forest ecology, forest stewardship, and small woodland management. And before coming to uh, be an extension agent, Lauren worked as a wood products consultant in Vietnam and also research assistant with Fire Ecology Labs at UC Berkeley and the Forest Service. Her expertise also includes amphibian conservation management, which was the focus of her master's at the University of Washington. And uh, we also have with us today, Ryan Gordon. And Ryan is the Family Forest Land Coordinator with the Oregon Department of Forestry. And he's housed with the Private Forest Division at ODS headquarters in Salem. And his work focuses on building and supporting the department's Forest Landowner Assistance Program. And Ryan has a PhD in Forest Social Science from OSU, which most of his professional career has focused on supporting partnerships and collaborative efforts around natural resource issues. Uh, and he grew up here in Southern Oregon and his family still owns some forest land. So I'd like to bring Ryan on and Ryan is gonna give us a brief introduction about what they're gonna share today and learn about forest management plans. 
Great. Thank you, Julie, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, the topic today is, is relatively straightforward. We are going to talk about forest management planning. Um, and in particular, we're going to try to focus on some of the different tools that are available to help folks uh, with forest management planning. And uh, we're going to look at Oregon's uniform plan as kind of a template today, um, which is kind of the Cadillac version of, of management planning. And we'll kind of talk through that, that continuum. Um, but I think that you know, whether you already have a plan or um, you're interested in just getting started, I think that uh, this presentation will be helpful for you. And uh, so I'm going to start up front with some of the kind of uh, opening and introductory pieces, and I'll be back at the end uh, for some concluding thoughts. Uh, Lauren drew the short straw today, and she's going to do most of the heavy lifting in the middle, uh, really talking through the components of a plan and some of the resources uh, that are available. And so Julie, I'll turn it over to you for the poll. Great. Thanks, Ryan. I'm looking forward to that today. So we'd like to um, start, we can't have each of you in the audience do an introduction, but we'd like to learn a little bit more about you and where you're from and how you might identify as a woodland owner, a natural resource professional from a private agency or nonprofit, and then how many acres of forest land you have. So hopefully a poll has popped up and uh, you will can start filling in there about which uh, area you're from and uh, how you might manage forest or be part of the or of forest here or around uh, the U.S. or we might even have someone from outside the U.S. today. So we appreciate everybody contributing and helping us get to know who you are and where you are at today. So even all your presenters today are spread throughout the Willamette Valley. Uh, so we're excited. It looks like about 63% uh, of you or many of you are from the Willamette Valley. So just give you a few more minutes to, uh, or a few more, about 20 more seconds to click that in if you haven't already. Uh, we again appreciate hearing where you are and, and how much acre you manage or if you uh, are just learning about forest land, this is a great topic too to, if you're just wanting to learn more about forests and how to manage them. So uh, we have the final results are here. Looks like 60% of you are from the Willamette Valley, majority of them, uh, but we have along the coast, Southwest Oregon, Central or Eastern Oregon, a few of our neighbors up in Washington, and even uh, three of you from outside the US. So appreciate everybody uh, coming and joining us today. Looks like uh, many of you are, about 78% are woodland owners, and then we also have natural resource professionals from all categories, private, agency, and nonprofit. Looks like the majority of you uh, own some forest land of various sizes. The 10 acres has about 13%, 10 to 40 has 20%, and 40 to 100 has our largest percentage at 30. And over 1,000 acres has about 8%. So pretty distributed throughout, including we have some that have joined us that don't own forest land, but probably manage or help put together plans in some fashion. So thank you for, uh, for telling us about you and, and we're excited to share with you today about management plan. So I'll hand it over to Ryan and thanks Ryan for joining us today and we'll look forward to hear more about him. That's really interesting. Um, good to see so many folks here who do own uh, land and also some pretty uh, large ownerships. I know when we teach this class in person, uh, we typically ask a lot of those same questions up front and uh, we do usually get a pretty good uh, distribution. So I think our audience is pretty representative of a, of a regular classroom today. Uh, so if we were in this uh, classroom format, we'd probably have a little bit more dialogue about why everybody's here today. Um, but I'm going to just try to kind of fill in some of those blanks on my own. Unfortunately, it's hard to have that kind of dialogue in this in this format. But uh, people are interested in management planning for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, some are really just getting started and starting to with their forest, starting to think about managing it, and they're really interested to know what they have and. Um, they really want to explore. Some folks are um, interested in accessing incentive programs like cost share to complete pre-commercial management activities or 
to address uh, invasive species, for example, or create wildlife habitat, or they're just looking to access some kind of assistance. Um, other folks um, might have longer term goals of getting involved with uh, the tree farm system or having some other kind of certification on their land. Um, or, you know, any of these points in between or some combination of those things. Um, oftentimes, uh, folks are just looking for a way to uh, start to get engaged and find a path forward. It can be kind of a challenging uh, environment to navigate. But really, the point is that people manage forests for a lot of different reasons. And to that end, I'm going to try to share a short, fun little video up front that uh, talks about some of the different reasons uh, and ways we manage forests in Oregon. So let's uh, let's see if I can make this work. Time for another forest fact break, brought to you by the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Today's topic: forest management. Oregon forests come in all shapes and sizes: large and small, young and old. In any Oregon forest, chances are that forest management is taking place in one form or another. But what does that actually mean? What is forest management? Think of a forest as a complicated system. All the parts need to work together, and someone is in charge of making them work to reach a certain goal. That someone is a forest manager. Hello. Now, forests are managed for different goals. Some are managed for wood products, others for wildlife habitat and some have a mix of goals. Forest managers figure out what needs to happen to reach those goals. Could be planting and growing trees. Could be thinning or harvesting trees. Could be altering the habitat to favor one species over another. There are three common types of forest management in Oregon. Reserve management usually means managing a forest for older habitat or wilderness. Wood production means managing to create the wood supply that we use every day. And multi-resource is usually a mix of styles to cover a range of values like wood, habitat, recreation, and lots more. Regardless of what they're managed for, there are plenty of environmental, social, and economic benefits that come from all types of managed forests. Forest management ensures that our forests stay healthy, productive, and sustainable for a long, long time. And that's the story on forest management. Check out more forest fact breaks or visit OregonForest.org. Yay, forests! All right. Hopefully, there we go. I think we're back to the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, hopefully folks enjoyed that short little intro. Um, you know, what we find is that most family forest landowners ma manage for multiple benefits. Um, but the point is that if you own forest land, you are a forest manager. And um, that also that management planning really is a journey and it can be a lot of fun. And that's kind of the point of this uh, graphic that I'm showing here on, on the slide now. It uh, looks a little bit complicated, but Basically, what I what I want to try to express with this graphic is that um, is the notion of this journey, and that people do have different objectives, which means that they have both different starting points and different ending points. And we talk about this as kind of pathways to stewardship. And you might um, choose to kind of jump into that journey at a different place and hop off at a different place, and that's okay. Um, today, we're going to talk um, about the uniform plan. Uh, the Uniform Forest Management Plan, which is a template we've developed here in Oregon that uh, meets standards of a lot of different uh, cooperating uh, organizations and agencies. And the process of developing one of these um, could be something that you work on for quite some time. Um, you might get started kind of at the, um, the top part of this upside down triangle and um, kind of make quick progress and really fill that out and then over time kind of slowly inch your way towards the bottom as you start to really put a fine point on a lot of your management goals and objectives. Um, and that's okay, and it's okay if it takes time. So uh, I'm gonna try another feat of technology here and see if I can hop over to a website real quick. I want to introduce everyone to uh, our, web, our planning management planning website, which is OregonForestManagementPlanning.org. 
and it's where we house a lot of uh, the resources and templates that are available to help with management planning. I'll see if I can get over there. Um, ordinarily, as I said, this is a, normally a hands-on class, and we offer folks um, a, uh, a binder that has all of this information printed out and kind of ready to go, and we sort of leaf through it. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do that in this format. So uh, you'll find a link to this website in the course resources for today's webinar. You can also go directly to this website. Carrie has just posted that URL. Um, and I don't want to spend a bunch of time zooming around in here. It might get kind of tedious on your end. But I just kind of want to show you that we've got a few different um, helpful areas on this website. And in particular, point out the Forest Management Plan Templates page which is where you can actually come in and download um, some written guidance and guidelines to help you develop a plan, as well as a template. And it's, it's that guidance and that template that uh, we'll be talking through today. If I can get myself back to the PowerPoint. If you had the binder in front of you, um, you'd see this uh, right up front, this colorful forest management uh, plan checklist. And this includes all of the various components that do go into completing a uh, full uniform plan. Um, and it helps to highlight, I think, for you the nature of this journey, um, the idea that you could work in uh, different sections at different times and, and kind of make progress. And you know, a lot of where we're going to focus, we'll, we'll talk through all of it, but a lot of where we're going to focus today is up in that yellow portion on, on woodland discovery. So before I hand it off to Lauren, um, just uh, quickly, you know, why would you consider a management plan? Um, again, people have a lot of different reasons. Um, a lot of folks are really interested in, in having a deeper connection and understanding of their forest. Um, for some people, it's a communication tool with their family. Uh, maybe they're interested in passing the land on in, to a future generation, or maybe they own property with several other um, family members, and it's a good way to talk about the goals and objectives uh, for, the, for the forest, especially since forestry is kind of a, it's a long-term endeavor. Um, management plans help to organize a lot of your, your um, documents and get all of your thoughts and ideas in one place. Um, they can help you better access financial and technical assistance. Um, it helps you keep track of things that you've done over time. Uh, maybe even for tax or other financial purposes. And finally, um, a management plan uh, that's, that's the uniform plan that's, that's completed in its entirety can help uh, get you certified to participate in tree farm, forest stewardship council, et cetera. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Lauren and hopefully our screen share strategy will work. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, okay, so I'm going to start going over the different basic components of a plan. And these are generally what Ryan described in that yellow portion of the table of contents earlier. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick review of these, but we'll go into more depth as we um, move through the presentation. Just sorry, right. Lauren, I've interrupted your... <laughs> Can you go back one slide? Thanks. Okay. Um, so goals, so we're going to talk about goals and objectives today or goals and actions. Um, a lot of people will interchange the words actions and objectives. Um, this is what you want your property to look like and what you want your property to provide. Um, there'll be maps in your plan and usually we include an aerial map, a topographic map, a map of the soils and water resources and roads. Uh, resource, resource conditions will include descriptions of the vegetation, soils, water types and what they look like currently and what you're, how you desire them to look or provide into the future. Um, it'll include a priority and schedule of actions. Um, this is sort of your operations plan, what you're going to do and when. 
Um, information on where to get help. These are the natural resource professionals who can answer your questions and get you access to resources. And then pictures and supporting information. And this is anything that you want to add to help you manage your property. Um, and this is also where we would discuss monitoring to see how well your plan is working and if there's anything that you need to change into the future. And this is a really open, creative portion of your plan. Um, it's a really, it could be a really fun aspect to it. Um, I work with a pair of landowners who every time someone visits their property, someone, they take a picture with them on their land and they put it in a supplemental photo album that they keep with their management plan. And so this can be really fun too if um, you're not just into lists and checking boxes like I really enjoy. <laughs> So the first section is goals. Uh, goals are one of the most important parts of your plan. Um, they relate to your, and I emphasize your uh, reasons and interests for owning forest land. Uh, very few people have interest in achieving goals set by someone else. So it really is important that you think about why you own land and what you'd like to do with it. And it's okay to have more than one goal. Actually, most woodland owners or forest land owners have multiple goals that they strive to achieve. Articulating your goals at the start of the plan is important because they form the basis of the management plan and everything else in your plan will center around steps that you take to achieve these goals. So in this section, you'll just need to list the primary goals that you have for your forest and then provide a short general description, including your reasons for including them in the plan. Okay, so we're gonna take another poll. I'm really interested to think about or hear about or see, I guess I'm just gonna see um, what some of the goals are that you have for your property. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, so we are gonna take a poll about, uh, on poll number two, um, on which property? So on some things about what you think about uh, overall, oops, sorry, that's the ending poll. Don't take that one yet. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, on, the, on today, the first question is, which of these goals do you strive to accomplish on your forested property? You should have uh, numerous options there and you can click on which one you feel is uh, closest and you can, can add a few. Um, and so just the question, there's multiple options. Appreciate people are starting to come in and pick which one of those. Um, so maybe grow trees and produce income, enhance wildlife habitat, improve woodland roads, protect soil and water resources, improve the forest health, maintain recreation opportunities, get family involved on the property, pass property, property to the next generation, maintain privacy. So about half of you voted, we'll leave it open for a few more, a uh, little more time, see if we can get a few more in there. So just like we often say, Lauren, people's goals are varied and it looks like this poll is showing that as well. Um, so if we take a look at this, it looks like, uh, you know, they're across the board, right? People are uh, have multiple reasons and goals on their property. So in the lead is improve forest health, and even that can mean different things to different people, but growing trees, enhancing wildlife habitat, protecting soil, um, passing that property to the next generation, maintain privacy, all of those uh, have gotten numerous votes. And so I think that it really shows the diversity that landowners have about their property and those goals they have. Great, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, this is really exciting. Um, it's a lot more evenly spaced than I usually see, which is, um, which is really interesting. And um, it gives me a good idea. I like to give examples as we move through the information. And I try to give examples that, that are geared towards some of the goals that you might see. So you can sort of start to think and picture how your plan might unfold. Um, so hopefully, so this is great. This gives me lots of options to be able to give you. So Thanks for, thanks for sharing that information. And, you know, there's obviously many more other options that you can choose for management goals. And so anything that you can think of um, 
is, is great to, to put in there. I know someone who has a management goal of increasing their physical fitness and health. And so they man do work out on their property just so that they can get more physically fit. And that's a great goal too. It doesn't always have to do with your property. It can, it can do with you. So, um, but actions, actions are a statement. Um, they're, they pertain to your goals and they're a statement of intent or commitment to accomplish those goals that you outlined previously. Um, oops. Um, actions are specific and they describe how a goal will be accomplished. Sorry, we got a little ahead of us there. Um, determining actions is dynamic and it might develop as you work the process and identify additional opportunities. And so just know that you'll hear Ryan and I say probably multiple times that um, your plan will change through time. And as you accomplish things, you might think of new ways to reach your goal or new actions that you can take. And so those will always be dynamic and changing as well. Um, but the important thing is that you know that these are uh, specific and they include descriptions on how you'll measure whether you've accomplished your, uh, or achieved your uh, action or not. So you know how close you are to achieving your goal. Okay, so here's some examples of some action statements. Um, you'll notice that they're pretty specific and they usually include a way to be able to measure when you've been, they've been completed. So example action statements are that you're going to produce $10,000 in after-tax income each year for the next five years. Um, you might develop 10 acres of black-tailed deer habitat um, within the next seven years. Um, you're planning to rock your roads throughout your property within the next 15 years. So or convert 30 acres of pasture to mixed conifer stand in five years. And this can be one in one plan. Uh, you don't have to pick just one. And so, and then these could also be, um, you can also have multiple action statements to achieve each of your goals. So there's lots of opportunity here and lots of ways to help you, guide you towards reaching those big lofty goals that, um, that we want you to have. Oops, okay. So uh, moving on to the maps, one of the first and uh, most common maps that you'll see in a management plan is a base map. A base map is a map that includes the boundaries of your property, typically over satellite imagery, and it serves to give you the context of your property within the landscape. Um, usually, uh, usually identify things within the landscape or features within the landscape, such as major roads, streams, and it always has your ownership boundary outlined. Um, and then often it'll have your legal section boundaries as well. All important information that go into your management plan. Okay, so the second map is typically a topography map. And the thin brown lines that snake around a topography map are called contour lines. All points along the same contour line are at the same elevation above sea level. So think of a contour line as a closed loop. And if you walk around a contour line um, as it never ends, you will never go uphill or downhill um, off of sea level. So a line marked at 6,500, for example, means that that point is 6,500 feet above sea level on the map. Um, and then the contour lines allow you to infer some general terrain characteristics from their patterns. So lines that are closer together mean steep, steep sections and lines that are widely spaced apart uh, indicate more gentle sloping areas. And underneath this topographic map, there's a hillshade map. Um, it's made from uh, LIDAR and hillshade maps are similar to topographic maps in that the darker areas are the steeper areas and the lighter areas are flatter. And so hopefully here, the darker areas of the map match up with where lines are closer together and vice versa. Okay, so a soils map is also really important. Uh, soils, we often find, or usually we recommend people get soils information from the Natural Resource Conservation Service web soil survey. And this is an online interactive website where you can put in your property information and the survey will give you um, information about the, sur the soils that are most prevalent on your property. And they will also give you some information about where your soils are in the context of the larger landscape. Um, so, which is really important because 
the really fine details of what soils on your property usually indicate you getting down and dirty in the soil, digging around and doing some um, and doing some soil testing of your own. But um, the NRCS Web Soil Survey gives you a great first look and in generalities about what you can find on your property. And they even have information about what species and vegetation can grow there. Um, if you are likely to see some erosion issues, give you some water capacity information and much, much more. You can get very lost in that website with all sorts of great information and even print out like a 500 page report when you're done. So uh, be careful of hitting that print um, after you've used the website. But that website can be found on our management planning website um, for more information. One of the other most important maps that you'll find in your management plan is a stand typing map. So this is a geographical representation of the different forest stands on your property. And just in case you're unfamiliar with the term stand, a stand is a grouping of geographical area that's similar in things like vegetation types, vegetation successional stage. So maybe um, you have the same types of trees in one place and another, but in one area they're 30 years old and in one area they're five years old. Um, typically it'll be areas where you might have a different groupings of soil, um, different topography, and a combination of these things. So the stands are usually subjective and they're based around your interests and management opportunities for your property, but this can be refined more as you walk around the property. The number of stands that you have will vary depending on whether we call you a lumper or a splitter. Um, and so basically what that means is how, um, how much do you like to pay attention to detail? So if you have um, mostly a Douglas fir property, but in the you know, southwest corner, you've got um, more of a mixed conifer stand. Um, it's up to you whether you decide that you want to split out that mixed conifer area as a separate stand or clump it in with the larger Douglas fir area. Um, so that'll depend if you're the lumper or the splitter. We just recommend that you be careful not to get too precise. Um, we don't recommend stands smaller than an acre, otherwise your management plan could be 500 pages long and take you a very long time to write because each stand will have a sub plan involved with it. Okay, so uh, your whole forest looks exactly the same, you say. What do I do? How do I have a stand map if I have five acres and it all looks exactly the same or has the same soil? That's no problem. You can have just one stand as part of your management plan and part of your stand map. Sometimes um, this is a great opportunity for you to be able to break up your property based on management goals instead. Um, maybe you have two areas of similar type where you want to focus one on wildlife habitat restoration and one part on generating income um, in the other section. So just take note that in your management plan, each of these units will likely have a sub plan and so um, that will help give you more information. So you'll notice on this stand map, uh, the forest vegetation all looks pretty similar. And so, but in, in stand one, you'll have a different management objective than in, let's say in stand three. Okay, so there's also gonna be a section in um, your plan for wildlife and um, I just wanted we just wanted to point out because this is another type of map it's usually not a map that goes in your management plan but it's a mapping system that you can use um, that helps give you more information for um, your plan and you can include it in your management plan if you'd like to it's just not typically there so the Oregon biodiversity map viewer is an interactive mapping system that was developed by the Oregon Department of Forestry to give landowners information on the priority species and habitats that may occur within their watershed. And so it doesn't mean that all these habitats or wildlife do occur on your property, but it just means that they exist within that watershed and there's a possibility that they could be there if the right habitat features were available. Um, and so this is a great resource. It gives you a printout, gives you information on, um, on the, the introduction portions of your management plan if you're using that uniform template. And it also gives you a list of species that could possibly be living on your property that you might wanna prioritize if wildlife habitat is one of your 
objectives. Um, additionally, if you're deciding to write your plan for certification purposes, um, certification does require uh, consulting with an authoritative source regarding the possibility of threatened and endangered species, and this counts as that. So um, this will help you identify if there could be threatened and endangered species on or near your property and give you information on how you might manage or put language in your plan to account for that. So just a friendly reminder that all of these mapping resources are available on our Oregon Forest Management Planning website that uh, Ryan just showed you earlier, and they're all going to be available in that resources on that resources tab. And of course, if you have any questions about using any of those resources, um, you can re reach out to your local extension agent and um, they can help you get through those. And here's some more resources as well. Okay, so once you get past your maps, um, then you're going to be doing an assessment of the forest resources on your property. So this is really the meat and bones of your uh, management plan. It's a description of the timber, the road network, your streams and water, wildlife, soils, and recreation. It's a comprehensive look at the current condition of your property and um, it is intentional that all resources are evaluated, not just timber, as many of you own your properties for reasons more than just managing for timber. Uh, so for the timber or forest vegetation section, uh, you'll want to include a description of each stand or management unit and include the age and species composition, how stocked or how many trees there are, or we could say trees per acre, um, in that area, as well as some other details. Um, some level of inventory, so you might get a, uh, an official inventory or crews done to identify the exact volume of the trees or um, numbers of trees and things like that. However, a thorough forest inventory or crews is not required to complete your plan. And you don't have to in disclose that inventory information in your plan if you don't want to. Um, but it is very helpful, um, no matter what information you have or what level you decide to manage, excuse me, measure your forest, and that will depend on your goals. So, so uh, you'll also want to manage or, excuse me, give a description of your soils. So you'll describe the soils on your property and all the mo soils that were identified in your soils map, and you'll include them in your description. Their series name, some of the characteristics, and how they relate to forest management. So if uh, we talked about maybe um, water capacity, holding capacity. So how much water that those soils hold on to might greatly affect the type of species that you can plant there. And you wouldn't want to plant, uh, let's say, uh, Douglas fir, for example, in an area that holds a lot of water and is underwater for a long period of time. The Douglas fir roots will be really unhappy with you and they might not make it um, as long as you'd like them. Uh, the water, in describing water, you'll want to describe all the streams and wetlands and their classifications, things like springs and ponds, and also the condition of the riparian habitat around it. You want to uh, talk about how well those riparian management zones are managed or are developed so far and anything you might be interested in developing into the future. Uh, for wildlife, you can use that Biodiversity Explorer or really just personal observations if you really enjoy going out and looking for species on your property and um, identify what species you know inhabit the property and if there's any species of particular interest to you and what habitat elements that they might need or that are missing on your property in order to reach um, achieving getting those desired species onto your property. Um, we'll get some information about access, so your existing road system, um, and information about the adjacent properties. And um, that information will include things like whether your roads are rocked, whether they're dirt roads, and maybe a maintenance schedule for your roads to make sure that they stay, um, they stay maintained and they're leaving their sediments out of the water. Uh, forest health is another section that will be included. It's an opportunity for you to identify if there's any insects, disease, or abiotic concerns such as drought. There's wildfire hazards and invasive weed presence that you can identify. And this is a great place for you to identify what strategies that you have to minimize those forest health concerns 
um, as you move through managing the property. Uh, protected resources are also important to note. These are those sensitive, uh, sensitive habitats or threatened and endangered species um, that are identified in our Oregon strategy plan as well as any state or federally listed species where we need to take special consideration and make sure that we're managing habitats so that those species are protected. Um, there's also some historical sites and cultural resources that need protection. And um, a lot of that information can also be resourced with the Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, and lastly, recreation and aesthetics. And so this section will describe your current or potential recreational or educational uses of the property um, and describe anything that's aesthetically important to you. So some people have just like this really huge legacy tree that's in their prop that's on their property that they've built a bench next to and the way that tree looks and the scenery around it is really important to them because that's where they invite their their family to come and have a picnic every year on 4th of July or something like that. So that's that can all be part of your plan. It's all about how you want to enjoy your property and share it with your friends and family. Okay, so we've covered a lot so far. We've identified our goals and our actions. Uh, we've created some maps. We've talked about all the resources on our property and summarize that information. Now it's to time to identify some tactics. Um, and so this is great because this section is your opportunities. This is the part of the plan where you identify the opportunities on your land to make the changes that will meet your actions and objectives and goals. Um, it's important to consider your constraints too. So constraints can include things like financial resources, topography, you know, things that make you compromise one tactic for another. So for example, you may want to thin your stand of trees, but they're on a really steep slope that will require you to use an expensive cable yarding system. And the size of the trees and the size of the unit won't make up for the cost of the logging operation. So this might cause you to, uh, this might cause too much of a financial burden for you. And so you may choose to change your timeline and risk potentially risk some health concerns to wait for the trees to become large enough so that you can break even on the operation instead of um, potentially invest financial resources into the operation. So those are some things that you'll have to consider um, when thinking about your opportunities, constraints, and timelines in um, developing how each step that you take to reach those goals. When your property's current condition is different from its desired condition, that's the opportunity to take action. So um, some agencies and professionals will label this as a condition as a resource concern. And so I'm gonna use those terms interchangeably um, and just know that, that they mean the same thing. Um, so the, um, the essence of any woodland management plan is the action section or this tactic section. Everything discussed thus far leads to the question, what should I do on my property, right? The answers aren't always simple and you have several choices to choose from, which is the best part, I think, because that means you can tailor your plan to exactly what you need and works best for you. Um, having the best possible information about your property will help you establish these priorities and decide what to do this year, next year, and the years that follow. Um, just a quick disclaimer that this part of the management plan is one of the most difficult to write. It does require some background in forestry and experience with some of the practical aspects of land management. Um, and it requires you to interpret the information from potentially a woodland inventory uh, to make sure that you can uh, get the right tactics done uh, on the property. But don't fret, uh, there's lots of resources out there to help you. You can seek the advice of master woodland managers, which are volunteers with the Oregon uh, State University Extension Program. You can reach out to professional foresters, and you can also reach out to stewardship foresters um, with the Oregon Department of Forestry to help you through this section. Okay, so I've used the word tactics a couple of times and tactics are uh, describe how you're going to meet your commitments 
as you defined in your action statements. And so just simply put, tactics are the management steps to take based on what you have or your property resources and where you want them to go so that you can meet your goals and objectives. Um, and typically we recommend, um, and Ryan will probably drill this in later, but we recommend that you plan about 10 years out to help keep you on track and help to make sure that you know where you're going and prepare for things as they change. And so tactics might include things like planting, thinning, doing some weed control, um, animal damage management, um, road maintenance, and the list goes on and on and on. There's even some on the slide here that I didn't mention. And it may seem overwhelming to think about all the actions and tactics that you can come up with, but that's why our management plan has a list where you can write them all down, prioritize them, and think about what's most important for you to get done when. So I thought I'd just go over a few examples of some tactics for you. Um, the point here is that um, you have an assessment of your resource condition. So you identify some sort of problem or you identify something that you have now that you'd like to change. And um, it points your need to take an action or create an opportunity. And the tactics tell you what to do with your property. So for each recommendation, you should describe specifically what special equipment you'll use, uh, what follow-up practices you might plan. And so for example, here on this slide, um, our research, uh, excuse me, our resource concern is invasive plants. And so what's the management recommendation here? So we wanna identify native plants or identify the invasive plants, identify the proper control efforts based on your objectives, um, identify if you have a tolerance for leaving any of the invasive plants behind. So if your goal is to um, get rid of 95%, you can tolerate maybe 5%. Um, and then uh, and then plant some native plants to make sure that the when you've removed 95% that um, those native plants are there to take over. So for example, uh, let's say you have five acres of blackberries and you'd like to turn that into um, five acres of trees. So maybe your tactics include in the spring, you're gonna mow or your neighbor has some goats and you're gonna have uh, goats come in. Um, and then in the fall, you're gonna do an herbicide treatment. And in the winter, you're gonna plant some trees. And then in the spring, you're gonna monitor and see how those trees are doing. And then follow up with any necessary, um, um, necessary uh, places where you might need to replant. So in these areas, so this slide makes it look really simple and it is really this simple, but when you're making your list of tactics, we just encourage you to go into depth about what you're going to do and all the steps that you need. So don't forget to include in your tactics here if you need to buy a fence, if you decide to bring in goats, or buy a backpack sprayer, if you're gonna do that fall spray, or if you're feeling like you wanna sit back and relax and drink an iced tea while you hire a crew to do this work for you, then hiring a crew should be on your tactic list. Um, and then also think about how you're gonna monitor your progress. So once you've planted those trees, you're gonna walk back through that every once in a while and see how many invasive species have come back and then how you're gonna attack those invasive species once they do come back. So um, there's one example. And then here's another example um, where we're gonna address an overstocked stand. So um, what are we gonna do? Uh, currently, our stand has too many trees in it. They're too small. Their crowns are, our crown ratios are small. And right now we're really concerned that they're really susceptible to either um, having an insect or disease outbreak or a strong wind coming through and blowing them all down. And so what we wanna do is get those trees well spaced with room for their crowns to develop, grow, and be really healthy and vigorous. So what are we gonna do? Um, we're gonna identify what the trees per acre are currently, and then calculate what the difference is to the, our tactic, which is pre-commercially thin the stand to 220 trees per acre. We're gonna mark those trees, um, which means we're gonna identify which trees we're gonna cut down and which trees are gonna be left behind. And then you can even go as far as doing a check inventory to make sure you have the appropriate stocking. So you go back 
through and you inventory how many trees that you have left behind and make sure that's close to your 220 trees per acre goal. And then think about, are you gonna hire a consultant to help you with this management activity? Are you gonna hire a logger? Are you uh, skilled with a chainsaw and gonna cut them yourself? And so thinking about all those things and how all those are separate tactics within your condition um, concern as they, reach, as they reach your goal. And then uh, some other things to think about when you're doing a pre-commercial thinning maybe are um, what time of year you might do this, uh, depending on the tree species, that timing of year is important, or depending if you have rocked or dirt roads, you uh, can only use, if you wanna harvest in the winter, you can only do it if you've got rocked roads in most places. So, um, and then other, also think about how you're gonna handle the slash management. So after you cut down a bunch of small trees, are you gonna chip what's left, burn what's left, uh, build some wildlife habitat piles so that you can meet some wildlife objective, and things like that. And then of course, monitor, monitor, monitor. Um, we always forget to mention that, but um, it's always important to look back and see if you've accomplished your goal so that you can check it off your list because I love lists and I love checking things off lists. And once you know it's completed, you get to cross it off or check it off and it feels really good. Okay, so you've seen this, um, you've already seen this, and um, this is our stand map again. And it's just a reminder for me to be able to let you know that um, the tactics that you determine are all on the management unit level. And so each one of these management units that you identified in your plan um, are going to have a sub list of your action items. And then a, a, for each of those action items, you're gonna have your tactics that reach it. So just a reminder that um, if you're a lumper, you'll probably have a little bit fewer lists, but if you're a splitter, you'll probably have a few more lists to do and keep that in mind as you're identifying your different unit types. Okay, and then Ryan, start to get ready. This is my last slide before you come back here. And um, just remember that um, recommendations for when you carry out a, um, recommendations for when you carry out actions on your property include um, a management activity schedule. And this will help you describe your timing and what budget you might need and a priority list. And so, like I said at the beginning, there's, you're gonna have long, long lists of tactics, um, but, uh, Ryan will talk about prioritizing and help you get uh, get your tactics in order so that you can make sure to prioritize them so that there aren't too many things going on at once. Um, and then the other thing to think about is that there's lots of help available to you. Um, don't forget to reach out to your OSU extension agent who might be able to connect you with a master woodland manager who might have some advanced advanced education training uh, where they can help you and give you some information about some of the things that they do on their own property. Uh, you can hire a forestry consultant who has a lot of, um, who would be somebody who has a lot of forestry information and can help you write your plan and help you do reach any of the goals that you plan. Uh, your ODF stewardship forester, which can help you make sure that you stay on track with rules and regulations and also give you some technical advice and assistance. And then OSU Extension is always here to help you as well. And then we have lots of online planning resources that we can always connect you to. So there's lots of help out there and um, we hope that you get started soon. Okay, Ryan, it's all yours. Great, I think I successfully wrestled control back of the screen. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you, Lauren. Uh, and you know, this slide is, uh, I think, really well placed. I feel like we always get to this point in the presentation and I started thinking to myself, gosh, this is feeling really overwhelming. Um, and so I just wanted to take a minute and pause here and um, reinforce the idea, one, that, you know, this really is a, a journey and it's not something that you necessarily have to bring together overnight. Um, you could work on bits and pieces of it slowly over a period of time, uh, reaching out to some of the different folks who are uh, listed on this um, slide. Um, 
And there, there is potentially cost share also available to landowners who are interested in working with a consultant to complete a plan. Um, we have some of that available through ODF. Uh, you might also be able to get some assistance from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, there are also some mentored planning opportunities, uh, particularly through OSU Extension and the Master Woodland Manager um, program. So I do want to highlight that. Uh, I know that uh, this is, can feel pretty overwhelming, and there are a lot of resources that we're pointing you to. Uh, it's a little bit abstract without having that notebook in front of you, um, but uh, that there, there, is, there is help um, to get through this, this process, and this today is really just kind of a primer uh, of what the plan looks like. So speaking of work, uh, Lauren's gone through the, the plan and uh, we've talked about uh, identifying a lot of needs on your property to help you get to the, the goals and objectives that you've outlined. And uh, that could be pretty overwhelming. Um, I, I know that it's fun to get out there and do a lot of this work. Uh, that's how I view it. But it also can be pretty hard to get started. Uh, sometimes the projects seem uh, pretty large and insurmountable. Um, and you may not always have all the technical uh, expertise and equipment that you need to do it. And so it is important to think about that as you also start to um, prioritize uh, the work that you want to get done. And I think, you know, prioritizing it, uh, one, in, in kind of an, a logical order uh, based on some of those needs and issues that you've identified, hopefully in, in working with um, a consultant. Um, or someone with some good forestry uh, background and knowledge. Um, but you might also start thinking about um, also the financial components of this when you're laying out your priorities. Uh, again, remembering that forestry is a long-term investment, a long-term endeavor, and not everything we do to manage our stand uh, pays for itself. Um, certainly not immediately, and in some cases, maybe never, depending on what your goals and objectives are. And so it is really important to be kind of thinking about that component and planning ahead to make sure that the things you're prioritizing are things that you can reasonably accomplish with the resources that you have access to. Um, but, you know, really at the end of the day, it's, it's about thinking about uh, what you need to do now to get to where you want to be in the future. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about adapting your plan as well as I move forward here. So the easiest thing to do is to create a timeline. And Lauren uh, mentioned earlier, you know, that we typically think about these, these planning documents as uh, being something that's set up for about a 10 year uh, planning horizon. Um, and it's, it, it might seem a little bit tedious, but it, it is really helpful to have kind of a schedule of activities set up, uh, particularly if you're like Lauren and also like me, you like to really be able to scratch things off the list. Um, so I have a very simplified um, example here uh, where we've taken some of the tactics that you might have identified earlier on. So maybe you want to rock your main road because you're interested in being able to have access during the wet parts of the year. Uh, maybe some sediment runoff and erosion have been some concerns. So that's something that you might do, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the dry season, sort of in early summer um, to set yourself up for access uh, during wetter times of the year. Maybe uh, in the process of doing that or in the process of kind of taking stock of what's going on on your property, you identified uh, that there's a pretty good scotch broom infestation uh, growing along your main access road. And so that's something you've identified that you want to address, uh, maybe either through a mechanical treatment or uh, chemical treatment. Uh, this is something that you might even get some cost share to help with, maybe through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And then these things really set you up uh, for work um, down the road. Maybe you're looking at uh, thinning a unit. Maybe this is a pre-commercial thin, uh, so you're not anticipating any uh, immediate return on that particular investment, uh, but it's important for ensuring the continued growth and health of that stand. But looking down the road uh, here, we've got you know, February 2022. Maybe this is an overly optimistic timeline. Uh, you do have um, uh, a harvest in a unit. It could be a selective harvest, um, or or maybe you're going to clear cut a unit, but it might have some economic return to help 
so that you can help recover some of the costs and reinvest those resources into the continued management of your property. And then really important too is um, thinking about, and this is something we've been talking about throughout, again, thinking about the resources component, who's gonna do this work? Um, that's, a, that's a really important uh, you know, part of the equation. Uh, if you're working with a contractor, there are a lot of c considerations there, uh, including you know, timing, thinking about who's available to do what work and when, and the costs associated with that. If you're doing the work yourself, um, you need to make sure that you, of course, have the knowledge uh, and capability of doing it, but also that you have access to some of the specialized equipment that you might need. Um, there are some safety considerations that you should you should certainly be thinking about, um, et cetera. So this the plan is really this opportunity to think these things through in a very um, logical and orderly way. So that when you're in the midst of trying to implement maybe a series of events, uh, it's a little bit less complicated. You've kind of done all this thinking up front. Um, this is also, I think, a really good point in the presentation to um, remind folks about reforestation. And uh, in particular, I want to underscore the importance of pre-planning your reforestation. I see a lot of landowners who um, maybe harvest a unit on their property and uh, they are looking to reforest it. Uh, they think that they might be able to go get some seedlings at a nursery um, or someplace locally kind of over a weekend and, and go out and put those trees in the ground. And it's really important to remember that you want to get uh, the right tree for the right place. Uh, seed is adapted to grow in certain areas uh, based on all those factors that Lauren talked about earlier, earlier around climate and soils and other things elevation um, and so it's important to make sure that you're getting uh, the right trees to go in the right place and that can mean working a year or two or more in advance to actually uh, put that order in with a nursery somewhere uh, so when you're planning a harvest you might at the very same time also uh, begin planning your your reforestation um, uh, strategy um, recognizing that uh, you know you have a couple of years after you harvest to, to make sure that you get trees back in the ground. So these management plans are a living document um, and it's important that you're continually reviewing and revising it. Uh, we recommend um, a revision at least every 10 years, uh, but this is something that's really best done adaptively as uh, you start to make progress. And a lot of things are gonna happen along the way as you start working through your plan. Uh, you're gonna learn things that maybe you didn't know before about your forest. Maybe your goals and objectives change um, as you either learn new things or you respond to, to markets or changing interests. Um, unexpected things might also happen, maybe drought. Um, Maybe you get an unexpected uh, insect or disease outbreak. Maybe there's a, a fire that burns uh, through part of your property or near your property. All of these things um, can change the, the, your plan and the, the trajectory, the course of your goals. And so it's really important to um, continually monitor what's going on with your resources and make sure that the actions and tactics that you've got in your plan are really effective in, in moving you towards those goals. And if they're not, then it's a, it's a, that's a good time to sit down and think about kind of renegotiating some of the things within your plan um, to help respond to those factors. But I think, you know, most important, I, I wanted to, um, I added this last bullet and I wanted to focus on that, you know, be kind to yourself and have fun. I think, uh, this is a this is a really fun, creative process um, that allows you to really exercise uh, a lot of your own interests and goals. Um, it can also be really overwhelming. So uh, take it easy on yourself. Set yourself up for success. Uh, don't expect that you can go out and get all of this done overnight. So I think on that note, it's it's kind of a good point here to kind of wind down and transition then towards some concluding thoughts. Um, 
again, I want to circle back to the idea uh, again that this is a process um, and you a process that you may choose to kind of jump in and out of over time. Um, it may not be that you want to move all the way through to a full blown plan for certification in the beginning, um, but you could choose to get there eventually. If that is something that you that is a goal of yours from the outset or becomes one later on, then it is important to return um, to that uh, initial colorful sort of document that we showed up front that talks about all those different components of the plan. And this checklist that we have here, which is also available in the resources online, um, helps you to know all of the things that need to be in your plan in order for it to uh, meet the minimum requirements for the uniform plan and, and to be certified so that you could be, for instance, participate in tree farm. Um, and I'm trying to think uh, what else I wanted to say along that line. Um, you can see that there are, you know, quite a quite a few sections uh, to be addressed here, and I definitely suggest that if you're if this is, if this is the direction you're going, that you do work with um, a forestry consultant, an extension forester, an ODF stewardship forester um, to help you uh, review all of these sections and and make sure um, that they are uh, complete. So our last slide here, I'm kind of talking about some of the final results. Uh, you end up with this, uh, you know, uh, dynamic document that really helps uh, to map out your plan to get where you want to be with your with your forest. Um, and I think I've already done that. I made some notes for myself here uh, to mention all the resources that are available. I think we've done a pretty good job of, of talking through those. I don't want to belabor that. Um, just know that this is something you can hire someone to do, something you can do completely on your own, something that you could do kind of in a mentored, um, in a mentored situation with somebody helping you with, with some portions, and that there really are, particularly in Oregon, a lot of really great resources available um, online and uh, something that the Partnership for Forestry Education is continuing to work on to try to develop more and, and easier access um, for folks. So I think with that, we can probably uh, start to wrap things up. I've got contact information here for, for Lauren and for, for me, and uh, you can certainly reach out to us or uh, whoever you work with locally. So Julie, Thanks. I'm gonna send it back to you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Lauren. I really appreciate some great information on forest management planning and about the uniform plan. We do have some questions that have um, come in. If you are both probably can jump in. Uh, the first one is you both have um, mentioned certification. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and what is its purpose? Lauren, I'm going to let you take that one if you don't mind. Oh, you're on mute. Whoops. Thanks. Got to do it. Well, somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> um, so certification refers to a sustain sustainability certification. So it's a above and beyond program that a landowner can um, join where they write a management plan and make a commitment to uh, go a little bit above and beyond um, their management activities to make sure that they're managing for sustainable resources. And there's a couple of certification organizations that you can be a part of. Um, and uh, it's a voluntary program and usually you as a landowner you get some sort of recognition so you usually get a sign that you get to put up onto your property so that your landowners know that you're working and going above and beyond and reaching those goals. Um, there's two that are really um, uh, that, sm that small forest landowners are uh, usually join. Uh, the first one is the American uh, Tree Farm System and that is a volunteer-based organization um, out of the American Forest Foundation. And they um, offer uh, guidelines and inspectors that are all volunteer, which makes the program free for, for family forest landowners. And so what you get is you write your management plan and then you get a visit with an inspector who's typically a volunteer uh, forester of some kind. It could be, um, 
It could be a consulting forester or an extension forester, an ODF forester, or a forester that works for um, another forestry company. And usually they'll sit down and read your plan with you and make sure that it, um, make sure it meets all the guidelines. And then they'll basically give you a free site visit and walk around the property with you and let you make sure that the plan matches what's on the ground and give you any advice or answer any questions that you have about your management. And so the other program is the Forestry Stewardship Council, or a lot of you might see FSC printed on forest products. Um, that's another organization that does do forest, um, forest sustainability certification. And um, that one does, the, so both organizations do follow third party rules and um, third parties go out and double inspect to make sure you're following their certification rules. Each group has slightly different certification guidelines, um, but the Forest Stewardship Council does require, um, uh, does require a membership fee and um, there are some consulting foresters and nonprofit organizations where if you join their um, their groups, then um, you pay a management you pay a fee to them, and then um, that helps pay for their the larger um, certification for Forest Stewardship Council. Hopefully, that didn't get too confusing, but um, they're both they're both pretty. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's great. I think that's really helpful for um, our family forest landowners in particular tend to go through the Oregon tree farm system. We also have a third one, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, but again that tends to be our larger landowners. So certification just really is that third party uh, that comes in and, and is a part of that process. So thanks Lauren. So uh, we were pretty Oregon specific today. There's someone here, must have been one of those that have checked Washington um, do you know if there's a similar organization helping uh, the, these type of plans up in Washington? And I think most of the plan would certainly apply, but do either of you have anything for our Washington viewers that might be of um, a good connection for them? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the Washington State University Extension Program has a course called Coached Planning, and so it's a... Um, Oh gosh, I think it's eight weeks. It's an eight week course where they do um, some forestry management education. And then um, by the end of it, you fill out a management plan that's similar to the uniform plan we have in Oregon. It's their uniform plan that they have in Washington. Um, and then I don't believe they have a management planning website like we do, but they do on their extension website, they have resources by topic that you can look at and they have a section called management planning where they might have some resources available for you. Great yeah, uh, resources, Ryan. Julie, that, yeah, that reminds me too. That was the thing I, I, I got stuck back there on the slide. And I wanted to mention um, that the uniform plan too is just a template that we have. You know, I, met, I showed you that checklist at the end and I just wanted to highlight that uh, while we think the template is a, a good tool and, and easy to use, you don't have to necessarily follow that template uh, in order to have a good plan, uh, you just have to make sure that you have all of the elements that are in that checklist represented in the plan. Great, and this kind of rolls into it. Um, you know, someone wanted to mention one of the things that they found really important in their plan was to make sure they had a list of their neighbors and um, and there's name those phone numbers along with if there was a fire, you know, who's their local fire department contact. So I don't know, Ryan, if you want to anything from the department on kind of fire topic and important of knowing some of those local resources. Yeah, I mean, uh, there is there is typically a section in there uh, in the plan where you can list a lot of those resources. Uh, I know that they do sometimes change from time to time, although the phone numbers stay the same. Uh, and it is really a great idea to have, you know, not only your your neighbors um, and folks who might help you from a technical perspective, but you might want to also put in some emergency contact numbers um, as well as numbers to your local ODF um, office, maybe your local uh, rural fire protection district. Um, those are all good things to have in one place uh, so that you can, you know, you can access them quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're just gonna take a quick break from questions. Those were some really great questions. We have a couple more and we'll give people a chance to type in some more. We just wanted to uh, highlight to everyone next week's webinars, next Tuesday, June 9th is Marilyn Ellis. We'll actually be both morning and afternoon. 
And in the morning will be about um, supporting your local rafters and the afternoon is the secret life of birds. So if you are one of those that marked wildlife on your values, this would be a great uh, opportunity to give a little, dive in a little more and learn, learn from Marilyn. So go to that same website and you can register for next, next week's. Uh, we also want a chance to um, have you give us a little bit of ending information for a wrap-up poll. So we're going to um, launch a poll just to get about today how you liked the presentation and if you found it useful and any um, feedback. Uh, so we'll continue on, Lauren and, and Ryan, if you guys want to maybe um, Ryan, close down your screen so people can see you guys a little bit bigger and get a chance. So we have a few more questions. So uh, we'll leave the poll continuing to go there for a little bit of time, but we'll keep going with a few more questions. And someone, uh, they said this is off topic, but I think it's related, especially to Lauren talking about the tactics. And where can we find examples of maybe contracts if you are hiring that logger or you just can't do all the work yourself? Uh, is there a place they can go to find um, you know, that, that information? So I'll just, I'll just start with um, the, our Oregon State University Extension um, has a publication on contracts for small forest landowners or for, uh, family forest landowners. Um, it gives you a description about the importance of contracts and then has some uh, sample contracts in the back for a bunch of different resources. You'll probably want to edit them to meet your needs, um, maybe um, consult with somebody who has experience with contracts, but it's a great place to start. Ryan? And I, I'd also, yeah, I'd mention um, uh, folks might be interested in if they if they're not already connecting with their local chapter of the Oregon Small Woodlands Association. Uh, that's a really great way to uh, connect with other folks who have maybe uh, faced some of these questions before and worked through some of these issues. Um, and just in terms of locating contractors as well, uh, the department is not able to make specific recommendations uh, of contractors, but we do maintain lists at all of our field offices for, for contractors who do different kinds of work locally. And so you can reach out to the local field office or your, your local stewardship forester and they should be able to um, provide a list for you. Great, uh, good resources. So this is also asking about some resources for mapping and what might be some software to use for generating maps for a forest plan? Um, other than maybe reinforce those that you talked about, or if you know some software um, that might be of use. Yeah, sure. Um, so there's there's quite a few. Um, some of the ones that I find really accessible are um, Google Maps is is pretty accessible. All you need is a Gmail address. Um, and then if you want to go a little bit further, you can download um, Google Earth, which it can be really cool because you can um, download some GIS files. It can read GIS files for you um, and it's a free program whereas uh, GIS itself is a little bit more expensive and is a lot more steeper learning curve. So those are great uh, those are great accessible resources. Also a lot of counties have a GIS interactive map. Uh, they don't, they're not all great but some of them some counties do have really good ones and they give you the opportunity to be able to draw your property boundaries and look at different resources on your property and get information even about water and some soils. And so um, I would start with those. And, um, and then there's a couple others that are available to you um, on the website. Yeah, I don't think I have too much more to add to that. Uh, you know, a lot of the resources that we referenced are linked uh, from the website as Lauren was saying. Um, I will mention that the Partnership for Forestry Education is working to develop a new tool that I, we don't have an exact timeline on when it's going to be available, um, but we're hoping uh, to make a tool available to landowners that would allow them to go to one place and um, generate a, a number of maps um, all together without having to kind of hop from website to website and sort of cobble things together. So it's definitely a, a need that we're aware of and, and we're trying to address. Great. Yeah, I'm excited for when that will come out. Uh, so uh, 
question here is um, this person's a consulting forester who's written plans, uh, especially for smaller landowners. And sometimes it can be difficult to touch on all planning elements required as they may not know not may not be known or pertain to the property. Any advice on, um, is there in terms of how much do you elaborate on these topics? So just, uh, you know, for example, if there's cultural resources or recreation, there's not much, um, you know, how much do you think you elaborate on different things? Um, I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, it really depends on um, your objectives and why you're writing your management plan. And so, um, it can be anywhere from just saying that, you know, putting in a sentence saying that I, I, I'm not, one of my objectives is not to include recreational resources or I have no cultural resources. I've consulted with Oregon Department of Forestry and I have no cultural resources to protect on my property. And as long as um, that information is just sort of addressed, that's fine. But if, you know, um, recreation is one of your main goals, then you could have pages on it if you wanted to. <laughs> so um, it's hard to say. Uh, it really depends on the person and your goals and sort of what, what you're writing your management plan for. Hopefully that, that answers it. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan? I don't know that I was just waiting for Lauren to blank to make so that she would take that question first. <laughs> I don't think I have much to add other than, you know, if, if uh, you choose not to put something in there, you know, probably just saying, saying why, uh, why it doesn't apply um, or that the information wasn't available, but these are the things that you tried to do to access it. Something along those lines is, is probably valuable. And probably uh, in tying into that, you know, I think the value to, if maybe you want to talk for a few minutes, we had several people that clicked on that passing down to the next generation and maybe take a minute to talk about the importance of the plan. And just like you talked about um, thinking about how it, not only for the plan for you, but how you might commu communicate to the next generation. So anything on that topic, you might want to elaborate or touch base or some great example that you've seen. I'll, I'll go first and then I'll let Lauren share. Do you have a great example you can share, Lauren? I hope, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We'll go from there. Okay. So, I, um, you know, the way I think about this is that forestry is, is like, as I said a few times, is a, it's a long-term endeavor. Um, you know, it's something that if you're, if, you, if you're into forestry, you know that um, you're not necessarily going to see a return, whatever that return might be, whether it's economic or uh, improve wildlife habitat or improve forest health, you're not going to see that happen for a while. It takes time as you, as you pull different levers and make different decisions. Um, and for that, for, for that reason, among others, it's, it's really, that's why the planning is so um, important um, because you can't just sort of change course on a dime. Um, you really have to be, be thinking forward proactively. And when we think about um, passing property down through different generations, um, it really puts that long-term notion into perspective. And the planning document is a great way to have a conversation with um, maybe the folks you're going to leave the property to in the future, or maybe the folks that you jointly manage the property with to um, gain some shared understanding around what those shared goals and objectives are um, and you know, what, what you're going to do to, to get there. Um, so it's really, you know, in a way, a conversation piece, a conversation starter, um, and maybe to a certain extent, a little bit of a contract saying, you know, this, this is what was important to me and that's why it is how it is today. Um, or saying collectively, this is what we decided was important to us, and therefore we're going to make these decisions moving forward. Um, so that's how I would frame it up. And Lauren, you might have a, a, a totally different perspective or a good example, too. <laughs> no, I thought that was great. Um, you said all the things that I could think of. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that management plan, like you said, is a great opportunity to, to just pass on what your thoughts were for the property to the next generation and have that conversation. And it's also just um, a really great way to sort of come up with some fun things to get the next generation involved. Um, I've got landowners that I work with that name stands after their grandchildren or name roads after 
their other family members just so that they get excited about coming to the property and visiting, you know, Abbey Road or whatever, so that they get involved and then you can bring in the plan as, as a way to start that conversation. So um, yeah, passing down the, uh, having that plan is, is a great thing to be able to get everybody excited about, about property management. Great. So we have a question here that someone inherited a piece of land that's in timber deferral. And is there any plan that has to be written that has to be given to the county to keep it in the deferral tax status? This is a, this is a common question and it's a, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, so it really depends on the county where you live. We see this play out differently in different counties. Um, I guess, you know, I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to your county assessor's office and, and ask them uh, what they're looking for and if there are any requirements. Um, what I would say is that typically having a plan uh, is really valuable and a great first step to sort of um, justifying to the county assessor that you do have a long range, you do have some long range goals for this property and you intend to, to manage, it, uh, manage it over the long term. Uh, and that's that's what a lot of counties are looking for, um, but it, it does vary a lot statewide, so it's hard for me to give a solid answer. Yeah, I just want to ditto what Ryan said, is that there's, when you're in the deferral program, there's an intent to manage and potentially harvest, and so having that plan helps show that you have um, those goals in mind. Um, and then for those of you in Washington State, I believe um, if you are in the deferral program, they do require a management plan. And so just um, do, for those of you in Washington, I would check with your county assessor as well, um, because they, they might actually want to look at a physical management plan. Great. Good suggestions. Well, I think that's the end of our um, q and I don't see any more coming in. So just really want to appreciate your time today and uh, that great information and great to hear uh, from everybody about the different um, you know, ideas and, and how to move forward with management planning. So um, we just have one, we have one more minute left and we had one more question come in. So you guys ready for one last one? I guess trying to get here under the other. Uh, umbrella. When you think about generation planning, you might look at the 2020 show which aired on OWN. Uh, it says there's, you know, there's different people out there that are um, looking to maybe not manage your property well. So um, I guess and one of those, the question is, you know, they're kind of just sharing their experience that they have um, you had people come in and try and offer in other suggestions and it really helped them have that plan as they're moving forward. So I think they were just more sharing an experience there in the Q&A. But, um, you know, I think that's really all these great resources that you've shared today can really help uh, people as they move forward and thinking about their plan and help them not make rash decisions because that forestry is such long term. So uh, thank you for all that you've shared today and appreciate your time and looking forward to uh, once again remind everyone if they want to go back and watch this webinar again it will be recorded as will all the webinars in the series and the tree school online webinar and visit that website and register for next week and we go all the way till July 28th so plenty of topics to keep bringing you back and joining us so thanks again Ryan and Lauren, really appreciate your time today and everybody have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was fun to do it. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>